Today's Animal Spirits is brought to you by Masterworks. Michael, we first had Masterworks on the podcast, I don't know, two or three years ago at this point. Scott Lenny's been on a few times. Okay. I think after our first podcast, we signed up. We bought some paintings, contemporary art, right? We're, we're art aficionados now. I just had my first exit Not from to a brag. painting. Not to brag. Totally to brag. Uh, Albert Olin had the Doppel build, which he painted in 2002. Masterworks bought it in January 2021 for $1.9 million, roughly. Just sold it for two point seven. That was a cool 33% gain for yours truly on a net basis. Or 2% after inflation. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is, this is, this is a the real asset. It's good. outperformed inflation awesome. rate by 25% or so. It's, so it's a good this haul. was my first haul. exit. I, I got haul. an email from them saying, hey, we sold a painting that you own. Check it out. Money was deposited in my account. What are you Pretty doing with cool. the proceeds? You reinvesting? I'm probably going to reinvest in another piece of art. Now they got a taste for it. <laughs> I was, you know, because we go into these things saying five, seven, ten years probably, but obviously they got a they got a good offer, offer they couldn't refuse. I'm a little jealous. Boom. I I have not yet been part of a, an exit, so it's kind of fun to see that. And I got the proceeds in there. So anyway, if you want to check out Massworks, invest in contemporary art, maybe have an exit of your own. Massworks.io, and remember to check out Massworks.io backslash disclaimer for more. Welcome to Animal Spirits with Michael and Ben. Elon Musk is just the world's biggest troll. I, th I think he took a 9.2% stake in Twitter as a troll move. I firmly believe this. So what's so say he 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 it cost him around three bill. What's his net worth? Isn't it 200 billion at this point? 300 billion? So one or two percent position? Yeah, big deal. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Okay, two hundred and seventy billion. Uh, so anyway, he, he's been talking about Twitter a lot lately. By the way, Twitter that is that it, it is okay. So so it is crazy how rich he is. That is that is almost uh, throwaway money. That's one percent. Yeah, yeah, whatever. He took a one percent position, zero, basically. Cares. So Twitter surged to like twenty some percent in the pre market trading today. I don't know what's up now. If you, if you've looked, I'm it, always it's almost like a, I'm I'm always curious. Like, how exactly does that happen? Like. Obviously, that's because people are there's orders being executed at that price, right? Got to be the algorithms that that just hit the headline. But it's, it's like a three billion dollar position for but him. But what do the algorithms say? If Elon, <laughs> then <Right. buy>? yeah. <laughs> anything with Elon. I, here's the thing. So a lot of people are already the funny thing to do on Twitter is to post Elon. Here's what you should do to fix Twitter. You should add an edit button. You should do this. You should do this. Here's my takeaway. You could probably, for certain people who are, especially like the power users, I'm sure that there's some things you could do that make it better. But is there really anything you could do to change like the DNA of Twitter to make it like a 10 times better experience if you just did these five changes? I don't know that there's much you can do. I think Twitter is what it is now and there's not much, there's no going back from what it is. I have a completely different take. I don't think okay. that you can necessarily change the user experience, censoring, whatever. I, I agree with you there. But from a monetization point of view, I think there's so much more they can do. And I'm not just talking oh, right. about... From a, from a business perspective, they could do it, yes. Well, I isn't agree. that what matters? He's investing. But, I'm, but the funny thing is, is that a lot of people today weren't thinking of it as, oh, they could make Twitter a better business. They were just saying, oh, you could make Twitter a better experience if you just do this one thing. All right, well, like, I agree with you has there. Their one or I, two think things. The I think the Twitter experience is more, more or less set. But, but yes, from I, a business perspective, there's a lot they could do. I still don't understand how... I spend nine hours a day on Twitter and it has no idea who I am. Whereas Instagram, I'm on a fraction of the time and it, it knows me inside and out. Yes, exactly. The, the ads, the ad experience, right. The, you, you, there are probably four things you tweet about all the time. Like they should be giving you t-shirt ads, Nike hat ads, and Nick's ads yeah, it's very all day long. Very simple. And they don't do any of those things. So, But do, do you think like... I mean, this guy just loves to stir the pot. How, how bored do you think he really is at this point where he's got so much money? Like, what is the, the motivation for him to do any of these, these stunts? Because, again, this feels kind of like a stunt, but I'm really intrigued with, like, he says it's going to be a passive ownership stake or whatever. But, I mean, what would be more surprising to you? Elon Musk comes in, grabs a board seat, and changes the trajectory of Twitter's business, or in nine months he sells it all and says there's nothing I could do. Yeah, like, I think, which one would surprise you more? I think he's out in twelve months, else if I had to guess. But I don't. I think he's probably the least the least bored person in the entire world. Did you see the video of the factory in Germany from the drone footage over the weekend? 
I don't think I, I don't bored. think he's I don't think he's bored. I think he he might be the busiest person on the planet. Okay, I I mean bored from the perspective of I'm sure he's always thought he was going to be a successful person, but with the amount of money he has, like what else can he do? So I think like the, a lot of the stuff that he spends his time on is stuff that it's just like cuz he he doesn't really have to care anymore. You know what I'm saying? Like he <laughs> he's got so m- He's got an ungodly amount of money. Well, he is by far the richest person in the world at this point, right? Like by a so wide I think, margin. So I think a lot of the stuff he's doing is he's trying to amuse himself is yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So he, he's not going to fix Twitter for you? The, I think the first thing he should do is outlaw the stealing of memes. You know when someone goes, who did this, <laughs> right? But here's the problem. <laughs> or it's like the person who you stole it from, that's who did it. I the think yeah, that's, is, a good, that's a good point. If you, if you steal a tweet, it should automatically at the person. They should build an algo that automatically outs the first person to do that meme. That's a, that's a good here's solution. The, here's the problem, though. He steals memes, so he can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> He's um, a stealer of memes. Uh, all right, so Q1 is in the books. So let's get to it. Uh, this chart comes from Lizanne Great quarter, guys. Lizanne Great Saunders. Quarter. Yeah, we did it. Um, and the best performer... Is the S&P 500, although actually I bet you the Dow did better than the S&P. The Dow's not in here. Well, value stocks, based on your table here, value I'm, stocks outperformed. I'm guessing, oh, I'm sorry, the Russell 2000, I'm sorry, you're right. The Russell 1000 value index down just 1.2% on the quarter. And the Russell 2000 value as well also outperformed Down just 2.8% on the other side. Russell 2000 growth, not surprising, we'll get into all this stuff, but down 12.7% and a lot, lot, lot worse for individual investors. Or people that were, I should say, I should say people that were selecting individual stocks. Not if they're buying in energy names. I'm sure there's a lot of people doing that, right? Um, I don't think they're in the growth index. No. Th- that's the thing, though. Do you think that, like, there will ever be a point where people come in and say, okay, energy, like, I'm chasing performance. Energy stocks are, are going crazy. Now I'm going to find it, like... I feel like you can't get excited about something like energy stocks in the way that you can about tech or some other biotech or whatever it is, right? Yeah, I mean, I guess because just mentally, you you must be thinking that what's the upside in an energy trade? Like, if if I absolutely crush it, forty percent. Obviously, you know, I'm, I'm making that up. Whereas with with some high flying tech stocks, you could do forty percent in a week. Speaking of bored, my dog is snoring up a storm. Oh my goodness. <laughs> you okay? Does your dog sleep in the office often? Can you see her? Yeah. <laughs> Dogs have the best life, don't they? <laughs> um, all right. So, so uh, there was uh, Bloomberg did an article on Tiger Global. By the way, yeah. Sorry, right, not to like bring down the, um, but I'm getting a lot of now that I talked a couple weeks and my dog had passed and had to be put down. The existential questions from my kids, especially my my son, is constantly What's asking about like, well, heaven and dying mm. and and. and well, if we all die, because our dog in dog years is 100 years old. So he thinks that everyone, when they turn 100, is going to die. And he said, who's going to live in our house when we turn 100 and die? <laughs> wow. And, and, and saying, it's okay if I die, because then I can go be in heaven with Ella. Uh, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not uh, ready to answer these types of existential questions yet. Yeah, Are you? No, no, that's tough. Um, no. All right, so Tiger Global. What does it say? They 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 fell thirty four percent in the first quarter. Is that what it was? Yeah, in the first quarter, like that is you put a little more work into this than I did. But does not surprise you how much of a is that a lag because of some private marks in mm-hmm. their portfolio mm-hmm. or what? No. So from the Bloomberg article, uh, Tiger's Tiger Global's particular undoing was sticking closely to tech companies, particularly China. So JD.com, for example. They put $200 million into this company in 2019, eventually produced a $5 billion profit. So it's the fund's largest holding. So okay. JD fell 20% last year, or whatever. JD got killed. So, so they said, in hindsight, we should have sold more shares across our portfolio in 2021 than we did. That's from what their investor letters. They, they were the poster child for over-indexing, buying everything. And I think that's a little bit unfair. People are saying that like, they're just spraying and praying and they're a levered bet on all this stuff. And Mario Gabriel did a really good piece on how they're moving so quickly. One of the things that they did was outsource a lot of their due diligence and gave them, you know, speed and the ability to be nimble. And, um, but anyway, what I thought was interesting was that since 2017 
And I think it might even be worse if you started 2016. I'm sure you could, you know, pick and choose starting points to whatever. Um, but from 2017 to today, they've underperformed the Qs by a ton and even S&P 500. So since 2017, the NASDAQ, 19% a year. S&P, 12.7 a year. Tiger, 6.5% a year. Um, I guess I would ask, like, I, I, I honestly, I honestly don't know. Are they are are they long only? Are they like closer to market neutral? I assume that they have like a huge long bias. I would assume it would be long. I, I would assume people aren't paying Tiger to hedge. Yeah, but that that surprises me. So I asked this to you and Josh on Slack this weekend when we were doing some back and forth on this. Do you think the Nasdaq 100 is now harder to outperform than the S and P? Depend. Well, I mean, this is a, it depends on what it does. Right, but the, I mean, the I, big five like, are what forty percent or more, could, or the big that's six. Probably at this point? going to be, if you're one of these tech heavy funds, that's your bogey at this point, and it's prefer like how, how many people are looking at like their venture fund or their private equity fund or whatever their crossover fund and saying, oh great, you guys did fifteen percent a year, the Nasdaq just did twenty five percent a year for the last ten years, whatever it is, like. But look you, at this chart. You, even, that- from, even from twenty seventeen to twenty twenty, um, they were outperforming the the Nasdaq not pro- not by as much as I would have thought. So here's the so this year that you said they were down thirty four percent. The Nasdaq was down what nine percent in the first quarter. The Nasdaq one hundred. Yeah. So it's it's not getting killed nearly as bad as as some of these individual stocks. It's it's still holding up really well. It's, I mean, I, I think it, to me it seems like the S and P five hundred on steroids because it's all those same big companies at the top, for the most part. Um. So anyway, I guess the takeaway is like what we already know that investing is difficult for everyone. Yes. Right. They have more information, more access to capital. Than probably anybody in the world, or you know, they're they're certainly on the in, on the upper end. They obviously have a wonderful PR machine as well because they're in stories all the time. Yeah, right. There's constantly stories written about them. Um, all right, moving on. Long global, short USA. This chart comes from. Oh, this is the t- title of the chart from Bank of America, and it, what it does is it shows the U.S. divided by the rest of the world. And the chart has gone parabolic. It's really been going up for years. I guess you could say almost decades at this point. What can, what can turn the tide? Is this just like our tech companies relative to everything else? So there's been like for the last few years, it's been growth versus value in the U.S. It's been the big you know back and forth, and can value outperform? I feel like stocks outside of the U.S. are now even more hated than like value stocks were for a while. Like value stocks have had the run. Because, I mean, since 2008 especially, stocks overseas have just lagged horribly. We've, t- we've, we've given this stat in the past. From 1970 to 2011, for, in U.S. dollar terms, the S&P 500 and the International Index, IFA, whatever, ACWI, were neck and neck over a 40-year period. Like a dollar invested was, was even. And different paths, of course, but even. And from, 2000, from 2011 to today... The U.S. is up like I don't know three x four x. Yes, it's. I mean, there. Are, you talked to the guy from who used to be at Morgan Stanley the other day, Adam Parker, mm. on on the Compound and Friends, and he talked about like why would you own international stocks if you could just own different sectors within the U.S. I still don't believe that. That's kind of the Bogle framework too. I think just owning U.S. stocks because forty percent of their revenue comes from overseas. I, I still think the idea that you get a diversity of not only like sectors and valuations and businesses but investors in those companies. I think that there's something to that. And obviously, it's like a, you're getting a currency diversification as well. That's the thing. How many people thought the dollar was going to collapse, remember, following 2008 because of all the Fed actions and the, the dollar's only strengthened? And uh, so that's part of it too. Usually, when the dollar is going up, international stocks are going to do worse, especially from the U.S. perspective. And when the dollar is going down, that's when international stocks tend to outperform. If somebody is going to say, I just I just can't own international stocks, I'm – not going to fight you too hard. I understand the motivation, but I, I, I can't get there. I think that some, like we spoke about this, the other episode, diversification sometimes starts really badly and it goes in and out of favor. And this has been out of favor so for a long, long time. I'm, I'm watching this show on Apple called Pachinko and called what? I, this Pachinko. Pachinko. Yeah. It's like a game in, uh, Korea, I guess. And the story spans two different time frames, early 1900s and then 1989 in Tokyo. And 
going into that 1989 period in Tokyo when Japan was on top of the world and they were like 40 some percent of world equity markets. They were enormous. And now they're, I think back under 10. Uh, that's like the risk. Everyone always does to us like now show Japan. Like that's why you invest in international stocks is because of Japan. I, I don't think the U S could have one of those. That was probably the biggest bubble of all time, but like, that's the risk that you're just the concentration risk of you just never know that that's why I diversify international. Yeah. I mean, if you could go back in time, there'd be no reason to own international stocks, right? Obviously, but we didn't know that. <laughs> yes. And now with all of these companies that, you know, multiple trillions of dollars, like is now the time to say, you know what? I don't want to own anything else, but us stocks. I don't know. Uh, it's not what I would do. It's also the, the, the biggest difference is just the technology sector, right? So if tech underperforms, I would imagine international stocks are going to outperform. Yeah. That'd be that'd be my guess. Um, okay, let's talk about the yield curve. So we've got inversions coming all over the place. I feel like there's a new one reported every single day. The five to seven, yeah. the two tens. Did it intraday for a second? So Jim Bianco has this really good chart showing how stocks react to an inversion of the twos and tens. And I I usually think that like the most times are different, like that every time is different. But I think that given like Fed intervention, how has the yield curve not lost some of its predictive power? So I like that you said this because we had this same exact argument, I think, in like 2018, 2019. Like there's, there's two responses from finance types. One is, listen, the yield curve works as a recession indicator every single time. It does. And then number two is, but what if it's different? Have you seen the, I don't think you watched Arrested Development, did you? Mm -mm. The original two or first two or three seasons are like I never some of the saw best Arrested Development, ever. The Office, It's Always Sunny. None of that. Okay, yeah, you missed that. So Tobias Funke, which is one of the greater characters, he he said, this is the meme that always goes around, well, did it work for those people? And he says, no, it never does. I mean, these people somehow delude themselves into thinking it might, but but it might work for us. <laughs> that meme reminds me of, of thinking that this time is different. And but I have that same mentality as you, though. Like, okay, it's worked every time, but like, yeah, real interest rates are negative now, or the Fed is so much more of a part of this, and all these different things. I'm, I, I'm, I'm like six, I'm like sixty five percent. It still works. Thirty five percent. Thirty five percent is different this time. No, you have to say it's forty. Remember, I'm sorry, forty percent is the, right. the line in the sand. I, I just I'm interested to see how the bond market, like how much that can throw its weight around. If eventually people say, why wouldn't I put all my money into one and two year treasuries now if they're yielding just as much as the 10 and the 30? Like, does the, does the bond market fight back a little bit? Like pushing, and pushing investors. rates, pushing rates down. Yeah. Like I think we, we thought that would happen. Like why, why isn't all the money from bonds going into short duration? Bonds well, I think right because now? a lot of this, is, a lot of this is, down? a lot of this is just like mandates from like pension funds and stuff like that. Right. That they have to, yeah. maybe that's the that's the problem. But I mean, everyone else, I guess. So I, I looked at, you know, the great thing about doing financial content for as long as we have. What's that? If something happens, you've probably, one of us has probably written about it before. Are so you I about looked, to quote yourself? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Allow myself uh, in, to quote myself. Yeah. August, 2019, I, I, I wrote a piece called, you probably can't use the yield curve to uh, time the market. So I looked, I did this for fortune, I guess. I looked back when the yield curve was inverted in the past and how long it takes for a recession. And it's basically anywhere from 10 to 22 months for the last five times this has happened. That was kind of the average. So yield curve inverts, 10 to 22 months later, we go into recession. But Fama and French, Eugene Fama, Ken French, who have that efficient market hypothesis that is 100% accurate. <laughs> Markets are always efficient. Don't let anyone tell you differently. So they ran this test back then. Hang on, hang 11. on, hang on. I have to defend, uh, I have to defend their honor. Mark, no, I'm just saying. Markets are efficient. People, Whenever something goes crazy in the market, someone go, ooh, efficient market yeah, hypothesis. That's I my, told that, you. Like, that, that's my least favorite uh, uh, thing. But no, no, no. Yes. Prices are always kind of wrong, especially, yeah, stupid shit happens all the time. But I guess if I could, my two cents is that you don't know whether prices are right or wrong. And therefore, exactly. they're, therefore it's efficient. That's all. Yes. Okay. So they looked at 11 major stock and bond markets to determine, like, if you could use an inverted yield curve to predict the stock market underperforming cash. So- the it inverts, then you go to cash. Does that work? They basically find they found like there's no predictive ability over. They looked out one, two, three, and five years. Wait, Kenny French and did they, this. They did this. They did, a, they yeah, did a back test. French and Fama. Yep. And they looked at this across the world too. Uh, this yield curve signal underperformed in 19 out of 24 world XUS back tests as well. 
their baseless premise was buy and hold is still probably a superior strategy. Shock, than shocking. To use I can't Optica. believe that that's where they landed. I cannot believe it. Hey, sometimes it's good to have a reminder. <laughs> buy and hold is honestly the 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 simplest, dumbest strategy there is that also 95% of people underperform. 98, 99. It's pretty close. All right. This is from Bloomberg. I mean, how I mean, yeah, yeah, listen. I don't think anybody beats the market over long long periods of time. Generally speaking, very gen- don't take offense. Generally Certainly speaking, not consistently either. Um, but it's not fun to talk about that all the time, right? So, yeah, it, it's, it's I fun like to pretend. To it's a fun reminder. To pretend. Okay, <laughs> this one from Bloomberg was kind of shocking to me. So, they they said last year was one of the best years ever for profits for corporations. They said profits surged thirty five percent last year, which that's not surprising because. 2020 was was so depressed. But here, this one got me. In all four quarters of the year, this is Matt Bozer wrote this from Bloomberg, the overall profit margin stayed above 13%, a level reached in just one other three-month period during the past 70 years. Think about that. There was, in 70 years before last year, there was one quarter in which corporate profits were above 30% on a uh, profit margin. What year was that? It did that? it every single quarter last year. I don't know. I don't know when it was. I'm sure it's probably in the last few years. Uh... They also said employee. He also said employee compensation rose eleven percent, which is probably higher than most people would have assumed. But uh, profits were up more, obviously. I would love to hear GMO's take on this because one of their like biggest things was that profit margins are mean reverting, and I don't think that was like an unreasonable call. I probably not in my head and agreed with them. Uh, and the fact that profit they, margins the- have stayed elevated for so long is certainly an outlier. And I wonder if like I'm not saying it's permanent, of course, but that busted so many models. But don't you think the majority of this is techs, the fact that tech stocks are such a huge part of the market now? 100%, 100%. We, yeah. we, we, so they obviously we, didn't see that coming. We spoke about this, I don't know, a year or two years ago. Howard Marks wrote a letter, uh, and his son was involved in this, Andrew. And they spoke about like how if you have a bearish view of profit margins or earnings or whatever, like you have to make a bearish case for tech. Pretty much. Yes. And That's I think that was the outlier was like the productivity that we've seen from these companies, the Googles of the world. We've never seen that is such so far outside of the scope of anything that we've seen in the history books. Yeah. And I don't know how you could say because everything that can be done with tech now, someone is going to try to turn into a tech business. Right. To make it more efficient. Yeah. And if, if we're dealing with a labor shortage and it sticks around for longer than people think, and I'm going to get into the labor market in a minute here. Companies are going to have to use more technology to become more efficient. They 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 have they're going to have no choice. So you think you think we're going to get robots in hotel rooms? Like, oh, why isn't the Roomba or is that what it's called, the Roomba? Okay, we okay. So you have this thing right here about travel going to be super expensive next year. I want to talk about this. So when I was at Disney, I, I forgot to mention this. No housekeeping. We were there for a week. The only thing they did was change the soap and shampoo in the bathroom and refill the coffee machine. But there was no cleaning of the room, no making of the beds, and then they'd give you new towels if you needed them. And I didn't know this going in. Here's the problem. We are way too, and it shouldn't have mattered, like that, that kind of thing. It's the only kind of thing that you notice if you were spoiled in the beginning. So like, I don't going to a hotel. Like, I don't even have beds made, to be honest. No, honestly, I don't either. But like, it's something, if you've had it in the past and you're used to it, and you don't get in it anymore, and it's taken away, then it's like, you have the loss of version. You go, wait a minute, I like that. Even though I didn't need it. It's like, when you're at home, like, how long do you let a towel go for, for the shower? Six, like six, a week? Six weeks. <laughs> like, like, no, and then yeah, you get yeah. to the hotel you get to the hotel and you immediately call down and like yeah I need more towels it's like sir you checked in five minutes ago oh yeah, yeah. Like, by the yeah, time like, you leave the hotel there's like seven <laughs> towels on the floor yes but so I'm saying I got used to it and they didn't clean like and we were eating in our room a little bit with the kids you know and there's crumbs and stuff everywhere it's like okay if you're not going to give me a housekeeper for a week I need a broom or something or I need a vacuum uh, but that's I think that's the kind of thing that people are going to be shocked by is you're probably in the future you know now that you have to pay for overhead luggage and that just became the norm after a few years ago that's going to be the norm for hotels now is that housekeeping is probably going to be something you have to pay up for. You know what? So we're going to Marco Island. We're taking the boys our first time in a couple of weeks. First time away with the kids. Uh, should I bring a dust buster? Maybe you should ask. I, I would ask. The thing is, the thing that shocked me about it is that they didn't tell us ahead of time that, oh, by the way, you're not going to get them to clean your room. Now, this is obviously the biggest first world problems ever, but uh, it was it was shocking to me a little bit. Our, our room was kind of a mess by the end. Okay. Um, well, you can imagine what my room's going to look like. 
True. <laughs> uh, average hourly earnings in leisure and hospitality are up 20.8% over the last year. That's the second fastest pace of wage growth on record in data from 1965. Jeez. Okay, so here, here's the thing. I realize everyone really, really hates inflation. People dislike inflation so much, and I think it's are you ready to apologize? Are you ready to apologize? About inflation? <laughs> no, because I think... I honestly think if, I mean, take away one leg of the pandemic and the war and inflation was transitory. I'll stand by that. You know, I That's, paid, I, I, pay, I, yes. I paid under $6 for my, for my gas the other day. So yeah, team, team transitory totally won. By the way, some dude dunked on me on YouTube a few weeks ago. Every once in a while, I still go in the comments and the guy said, Savage. I, I, a guy said, I stopped listening when Michael and Ben were so adamant that inflation was transitory. I don't think we were adamant. I just think we said that was our take. No, no, and, well, uh, no, ho- hang on. Now, now you're moving the goalposts. I, we were definitely team transitory. Take the L. No, we were team tra- – I don't think we were adamant, though. I think I mean, we, we said, like, it's used cars. That's what we were so – we were looking at the data saying it's used cars, and now, of course, everything cut up. But So anyway, this this guy said, uh, I don't I don't listen anymore or watch, and I said, well, thanks. I, I, I don't know how we're going to do it without you. Wait, and hold he on. Said, if, he's not, if he's not watching, then, then what was he doing in the comment section? Of course, he just checked back in. But he said, <laughs> he, he said so I said, what are we going to do that? And I, I think I, I commented, I said, what are you doing here? He said, my viewership is transitory. Ooh. Not bad. <laughs> burn. Not good burn, good burn. <laughs> okay, Sam Stein at Politico said, a shocking data point that explains much of Biden's political troubles. More people think jobs have been lost over the last year, 37%, than those who think they've been gained, 28%. Unemployment is at 3.6%. We are probably in the hottest job market ever, for us, and I think it's probably hotter. Than, so it was, unemployment rate was 3.5% before the pandemic hit. We're basically back there. We've climbed out of the hole. It's almost, I think we created like 1.6, 1.7 million jobs in the first quarter. I, I think people, maybe maybe it's the labor shortage. Like, what do you think it is besides it's inflation permanent. and no, labor no, no. shortage? It's permanent. This is, this is what it is. Remember that book, Factfulness? I think they spoke about this, that people always assume that their lives are better than the rest of the world. That, like things are okay in your neighborhood, ah, but things yeah. are getting really bad. The world is burning around you, but things are okay where you live. I think it's that. I think thing. that's, I think that's the internet. You're right. I think that yeah. mentality is just kind of, so this Bill McBride chart that we've shown a million times, it's the percentage of job losses. You can see it's almost all the way back. Just that. That's so crazy. Best, uh, cr- so the, lowest- the craziest chart in, in, I want to say this is like top 10 craziest chart in, in, in all of finance. Right. Show someone this in 2019 and say, look what's going to happen to employment over the next two years. And they'd go, what just happened? How, how would you explain that? Okay. So the lowest, the unemployment rate going back to 1948 has ever been is 2.5%. So we're kind of, we're squeezing. I, the analogy I made is we're kind of squeezing the toothpaste here, but here I want to, I want to go over this thing that like no one wants to work anymore. So Wait, I hang, hang on, so, before we get there, just, just real quick, this, uh, I forget who tweeted this, uh, uh thought I put it in here. All right. Today's job report marks two years since the U.S. began hemorrhaging jobs at the fastest rate on record. More than 22 million jobs lost in just two months. With another begin in March, we've now regained all, boy, all but 1.6 million of those jobs. This chart is nutso. The, retor- the retort from the egg guy on Twitter would be like, yeah, that's because we printed trillions of dollars. It's like, yeah, it worked. Yeah, and it worked. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it, of course. Yes, the trends are up. But here's the other thing: people say no one wants to work anymore. So prime age U.S. population is 25 to 54. That's like prime age. That's your when you're working. You know, 25 to 54 is now at an all-time high. U.S. labor force. It's surpa- it's back surpassed the amount before. Uh, 55 and over is within a stone's throw. So you know, people say, well, a bunch of people retired early. And but that is back. almost back to where it was too. So people are. People are wanting to work. So I looked, too, at the U.S. labor force participation rate for 25 to 54, going back to, like, 1950. It was, like, 60% back then. It's 83% now. Yeah, Obviously, you, that's yeah, a lot of women you, coming if, into the labor force. If you believe those numbers, sure. Right. I, I, <laughs> the number of people who say that on Twitter to me <laughs> is, yeah, I don't really believe these. Okay, this is from Ben Castleman. This is crazy. The, wage, the rate of wage growth among the lowest wage workers right now is remarkable. No sign of slowdown whatsoever. Look at this. The lowest wage group. Look at, the, look at that growth that they've seen. Isn't this crazy? So, so here's another isn't, one. Isn't this a huge part of inflation? And uh, listen, this is a good thing, but people at the lower end who spend all of their money, right? These are, these are not net savers usually. So the highest wage earners are seeing the slowest wage growth and the lowest wage earners are seeing the highest wage growth by far. It's not even close. And, mi- mi- and, and, and middle class is getting crushed by inflation. Here's another one. This is from, uh, this is a new Substack I follow. Uh, Joe Politano, you follow this guy? Mm-mm. 
I can't even pronounce this, Apricetus Economics. He says uh, layoffs are at an all-time low. Layoffs and discharges, people being laid off from their job, all-time low. Uh, my friend Tamlin Smith at the New York Times wrote a piece about Nebraska. They have the lowest unemployment rate in the country, 2.1%, the lowest state. They interviewed this bartender, and she says, I'm in hot demand, baby, mentioning desperate employers with a burst of a grin. I've worked at like six bars in the last six months because I keep getting better offers I can't turn down. Workers have never had this much negotiating power, mm -hmm. not in the last 40 years. So here's, here's like the downside of this, if, if you're looking for one. But kind of like I said, well, every you inflationary look, you spike. Look, you don't have to look that hard. No, well, yeah, right. But, but the, I've shown this data before that the returns are better from 9% unemployment and higher than they are from 5% and lower, right? So I actually looked at, I've done those average returns, and it kind of goes at a stair-step well, yeah, function like you'd it's, think. It's spare market. It's counterintuitive to a lot of people, though. So I looked at what are the worst returns over one, three, five, and ten years from below five percent unemployment, five to seven, seven to nine, and nine and higher. Basically, the, the worst the outcomes. Isn't it like tech, tech bubble, oh six, oh seven? Well, yeah, but but the kind of like the only way inflation has come down is through a recession right. in the past. Like most recessions are not caused by a low unemployment rate, but. A recession tends to start there because that's when you get excesses. What do you think the right? pop, what, what would you say the probability of the Fed orchestrating a soft landing, bringing inflation down without a recession? And don't say fifty. It, de it de forty percent. <laughs> it depends what they're. If they were to say like, listen, our target's not two percent anymore; it's three or four percent. I think the market would actually like that answer. And say you the know, question. What? A soft landing with no recession. What's the time frame? <laughs> it's a hard it's 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 25 percent. it's a low percentage okay so you would say 75 percent chance of a recession in the next whatever call it one if, to two if years. the fed says we're going to shut off inflation i don't see how we don't go into recession or at least a little slow down so um you can now bet on this we told our friends at kelshi uh we want to bet on the number of hikes and so they now have a bet, and it says at the end, this market is proposed by Animal Spirits. Wait, so we have our own bet. I actually didn't even see this. I mean, I know we spoke about this, but so now we can bet on the number of hikes? So you can bet on – so if you go there right now, yeah. the number of hikes that is – so you can bet on four hikes, five hikes, six, seven, eight, or nine and above. Can you, like, bet, like, not seven? Oh, yeah, yeah. You yes. Can, oh, yeah, okay. So you can bet not – All so right, so can, what's You can no. short some of them, too. So I want to short seven. And I just, I just want to let you know, though. 25 basis points counts as a hike. So 50 basis points would not be one hike. That would count as two hikes. I get it. I get it. So, so seven right now is the highest probability of happening based on Kelshi's numbers. What? I'm shorting that. Wait, so what's, so what's no? So you could buy no for 75 cents on seven. So, you, the yeses so, you, are all so you've got 20, because, so you've got 25% upside. So wait, what, so what is your target for fed funds rate at the end of the year? <laughs> <laughs> uh, like, we're, so if two, it was, and if it, two and a half. Okay, so two and a half of that, how many hikes would that be? Divide that by 25 basis points. That's 10 hikes. So sure. you're buying yes at, so you want 10 hikes, you buy yes at 11 cents. You're going to make nine to one on your money. Wait, did I say no? Count me for a yes. So you, you think two and a half percent. So again, each 25 basis point one counts as one hike. So if they did 50 basis points, that, that's two hikes. What's, wait, when, when does this end? December 31st? End of the year. It, this is this is through number of Fed hikes in 2022. By the way, you, so just, you're saying, you just saw how the sausage is made. You just got a glimpse into my brain. Now I'm fading myself. <laughs> I'm, taking, I'm taking yes. You're going to bet yes and no on the same bet. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, isn't that an arbitrage? Okay, so here's, here's what I would money. do. Here's what I would do. I'd probably bet yes on seven, eight, and nine. And you still have a higher payout there because the combination of those is like 50. All right, whatever. I'm taking the over. Uh, apparently, I'm taking the over. Over on what? Over seven? Seven or over. I might just... But wait, hold okay. on. So if you... You bet... Wait, hang on. This is important. Is it at least... Because I don't want to lose if I take seven and there's actually eight hikes. Do you have to nail no, the... That's you have to nail the exact. So that's why oh, you have to bet on a few right. of well, them. That makes it, that makes it, now, that, now that's a, that makes it very difficult. It's, so I have to spread not, my bets. Why... Oh, I got it. I got it. So maybe I'll do I'd seven, eight, bet... nine. I bet seven, eight, nine. Okay. Why was six afraid you... of seven? <laughs> What is it? Because seven, eight, nine? Yeah. Is that it? All right, I got it. All right. I've got kids too. All right. Uh, Mike Zaccardi posted this one. This is kind of interesting. Consumer spending on energy and food. I think this might be from the JP Morgan yeah. guide to the markets. 
What, oh, food what, and what, energy. What gave it away? Does it say it on there? Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's that's in italics and in small font. All right. By the way, I do have I have better than twenty twenty seeing. I uh, what do you say? It? Seeing <laughs> eyesight. <laughs> my I, my my vision is starting to go, just like my hair. Really? I'm, it's okay. it's unfortunate. Glasses, glasses or contacts? I couldn't do contacts. I, I couldn't touch my eyeball. Yeah, I'm not a con. Uh, I, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna wait it out. <laughs> Anyway, what are we looking at? 1960, food and energy accounted for 27%, call it, of consumer spending. Now it's 12%. Energy peaked in late 70s, early 80s at almost 10%. It's now 4% now. So energy prices would have to more than double from here to account for as much of a budget as they did back in the 70s and 80s. Why do you think food prices were so much higher back then? Inflation? No, I don't know. But, well, productivity. No. It's way easier to make food. Productivity, yeah. yeah. That's got to be it. Um, Carl Quintanilla tweeted, this is from Morgan Stanley, the U.S. car market is not a car market at all. It's a truck market. We believe the first signs of demand destruction will be with low-income consumers buying gas-guzzling trucks. So this Good. chart showing- Good. I've said this before. This is my one spend shaming thing that I do not feel guilty about. Starting, People spend way too much money on SUVs and trucks. Starting price divided by mile per gallon. I've got to tilt my head to, to look at this. So the Chevy Tahoe, so shame Tahoe owners, the Sierra, the Silverado. Okay, those Tahoes are like, I bet right now you'd buy a new one for 90 grand. Yeah. Easily, right? Yeah. Everyone at my, at the kids' soccer and basketball games is driving a Suburban or a Tahoe. I can't Not wait many to get a minivans. minivan. I got, I got to get a minivan. Minivans aren't that but expensive minivans are, are they not? No. Uh, speaking of spend shaming, here's the other side of this. So I, we talked last week about the fact that a lot of times your upside in retirement savings is, is much greater than your downside. For most people end up with more money than they assume. It's people that start with a decent nest egg. I'm reading this book. Someone recommended it. It's called Die With Zero by Bill Perkins. Have you ever heard of this? A mm -hmm. bunch of people have recommended it to us. Uh, I don't want to talk down. Like it probably could have been a podcast as opposed to a book, but his whole, his whole thing is especially for people who are, who are relatively well off and wealthy, your, your whole thing should be trying to enjoy your money and spending it all before you die. Spend it or give it away. Agreed. Right? So I, we talked about this last week. Someone sent this to me, and this is a story from 2016. I think we've all heard about it. It's like this uh, janitor bought all these stocks over time, and he, by the time he died when he was 90, he built an $8 million portfolio, and he gave it all away to a hospital and library. And he did this because he maintained a very frugal lifestyle. Now, a lot of f personal finance people look at this and say, this guy is a success story. He invested in stocks that paid great dividends. He had $8 million by the end. Why and he didn't lived he, do, a frugal why didn't he give it away while he was alive? What did, think about the, the satisfaction thing. he would have gotten from that. I think Ben four years ago or five years ago, whenever I started blogging 10 years ago, would have looked at this and go, this guy is a success story. Now I look at this and I think of this guy's, you know, that's not a success story. Like I think frugality is a disease just as much as overspending is. Yeah. For people who can't make themselves spend, like I agree either, like if you don't want to spend it on yourself, that's fine. Some people can't force themselves to, like my father does, if he never had to buy another article of clothing in his life, he probably wouldn't do it. Like he, he's not a person that likes to spend money on himself, right? Like there are people that are like that. But I think then you, you spend your money to make other people happy or something. Like I, I think like, I don't see this as a success story as much as I would have in the past. That like he like enjoyed a little bit, have some fun, right? Mm. Yeah, can I could right. literally cannot agree more. Here's another. This someone else sent this to. It's kind of on the same thing. This is an older one from the Atlantic, but I thought it was so. Uh, Michael Norton, who wrote that book, uh, Happy Money. You read that one? Mm -mm. Okay, really good book. Uh, did a research report in 2018. He and his collaborators asked more than 2,000 people who have a net worth of at least $1 million, including many of those with wealth that far exceeded that threshold, how happy they were on a scale of 1 to 10, and then how much more money they would need to get to a 10. All the way up the income wealth spectrum, Norton told me, basically everyone says they need two or three times as much to be perfectly happy. That number is always going up no matter what because there's always people richer than you. Yeah, I really... This is... this. I mean, this is not so obvious, in my opinion... Once you are past a threshold, I think the studies say $75,000, whatever it is, it could be 200, 300, I don't know, whatever it is, 
past that point, money does nothing, literally nothing. I also think your comparisons today are to everyone else in the entire world now. And you can always see someone with a little bit more than you or more vacations or more house or more, whatever it is. And I think the goalposts today are easier to move than they ever were in the past. Or in the past, you could just see people in your local community. And that was, you could have been a big fish in a small pond much easier than you can today. Now we're yeah, all fishing in a big pond. Think about if you had, assuming that you're, there's a gigantic gap between not having enough money and having enough money. That's where all the happiness is, right? Like when you could, obviously, if you can't put food on the table, yeah, money is life changing. But what would, for somebody that's like relatively well off, what would another million dollars do for you? Exactly. It like doesn't change your. Literally, what would you do with that? Right. I agree. Preaching the, yeah. And, and honestly, this is something I've changed my mind about a lot as far as like personal finance goes. I was always the frugal saver person. And I've, I've definitely changed my tune on that. Over yeah. The I, so, I mean, listen, we change our opinion over the course of our life. I might change my mind again on this topic in five years, but as of today, 37 year old Michael has no ambitions to die with a lot of money. Amen. All right. One quick one on banks. Are, are financials doing well this year? They have to be. So, uh, credit card rates are up at 16% on average. Savings accounts are averaging 0.06% at banks. Axios did this piece on this. Basically saying banks are not pressured at all to raise those savings rates because they have more than enough deposits. We've seen, seen all those record deposits at banks. Like they're going to be very slow to li- like savings accounts are basically dead at banks. And people who leave their money in there, it's just, it's complete dead money. Can I tell you something? Speaking of uh, changing rates, I actually did get gas under four dollars a gallon this week. So, in New York, yeah, I think we're still at. Yeah, I found some places in Michigan that are like three ninety something. So crude came down, gas came down. Do you have any takes on that? It took, it took a lot longer though. Why did it take four weeks? It just seems like it did. Okay, someone the analogy someone gave me was, it's rocket ships and feathers. Rockets on the way up, feathers on the way down. Rockets. Okay. Oh, interesting. Um, all right. Okay, so Bespoke uh, tweeted this. Mortgage rates have gone from record lows to 10-year highs in a little over a year. At 4.9%, the last time the 30-year fix was as high was April 2011. Pretty wild. I don't think, this, I think, I don't think some this, of the stats were that it's like this is the, the fastest increase of that, that magnitude ever. I don't think this will change uh, demand for homes, but it certainly should impact prices. I hope so. So that Brett Redfin had a, Redfin had something saying like maybe we're finally seeing a, a pause. And he interviewed this guy in the Bay Area, and he says bidding wars are still common, but homes that would have been bought in ten or more uh, offers earlier this year are now getting half that many. A house that might have gone for seven hundred thousand over list now may go for three or four hundred thousand over list. Uh, wow, so it's getting so much easier for people there. Uh, here's another one: new listings for homes were down seven percent from a year earlier, the biggest drop since the four weeks ending February twenty. 13th, 2022, basically the supply just keeps going down. Record 59% of homes that went under contract had an accepted offer within the first two weeks on market, up four percentage points from a year earlier. I think that is the the problem is the the supply thing. Maybe people wait a little longer because they have the higher mortgage rates now, but the supply thing being so short still, I think this is going to be a really bizarre market for a while still. Yeah. Um, All right, let's talk about our, let's talk about our discord for a second. So I wrote a post on this. So first of all, thank you to everybody that bought NFTs. There are still plenty to buy, by the way, and all the money is still going to Nook and Hungary. We sent, so this is amazing. We sent, the first batch that we sent over was like 12 something ETH. And we got a match. This was news to us, Ben. We got a match from the giving block. So we sent over 25 ETH on our first shot. We've got another six to send. So we've- what I think they basically said like, any crypto donations to charity will be matched up to $5 million or something like that, right? And it just uh, happened to be that we timed it that way. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, we've so we've sent over $100,000 to Nook and Hungry, which is, I mean, incredible. Um, so one of the things that we severely underestimated was how powerful Discord was. I had – my only experience on Discord to date was getting rugged on that uh, – on that. Oh, that was through Discord. That's right. That was through Discord. And so I was like opposed to it. I figured that it was going to be a lot of work for us and we just don't have the time of the day. But people are hyper engaged and it's not work. You pop in, you pop out. People it's are like Slack, basically. It's Slack. And people are 
uh, let's just read a few quotes. Uh, I'd almost By say the way, before we yeah. get to these quotes, yeah. The Discord thing, like people had access to it, they could get in, and I looked on it the first time I signed in, and all of a sudden people are there engaging and talking to each other. It was I thought it was gonna be like, okay, we're gonna have to be the ones getting the ball right. rolling, but it's the people in this community are having interactions with one another. It's it's awesome. And I think we'll, well from from here on, from here to four, we'll call them animals. Yes, I'm not gonna cancel for that. Um, I don't think so. It's it's done I'm with kidding. love. I, okay. All right, I'd almost say it was a borderline genius idea. Oh, so we've got one channel called Connections where people are just talking about themselves and so people can right. know who... This is my we, age, this is what I yeah. do, this is my have, job, this is where I we live. Can't, we can't see our listeners and we have no... I mean, we hear from, you know, in the inbox, but we... But anyway, all right. Uh, I rarely post anything on social media, but I feel like this is the exact community where I feel comfortable being an active participant. Was able to help a few members with CFA study plans. So between keeping kids fed and helping our community members, feeling pretty good. Here's a good one. Someone said, I've already received more from this Discord in the first week than I expected entirely. I think I have too. Same. It's, it's So we got like a recommendations tab, a markets tab, all this stuff we're talking. Um, so if you want to get in on that, buy one of the NFTs. The uh, NFT gives, actually, you, gives, gives you access. Gives you access to the Discord. And it, again, if people are going back and forth and talking to each other and helping and off, it's, it's really kind of cool to see the community. Uh, we did get one direct message that we, so someone said, hi, Michael and Ben, I want to thank you both for putting this together and using your platform to help others. Like myself, I'm sure this was the first NFT purchase for a lot of people. Ben, I feel your pain navigating the blockchain world. I have a special request. It's my dad's 64th birthday on April 14th. My dad and I listen to your podcast every week, and we'll catch up afterwards to chat about each episode. <laughs> a happy birthday message from the two of you. would surely make his day. Thanks in advance of the podcast, Chris Curtis. Happy birthday to, to Chris's to dad. Name? We don't have, his, we don't have his, the dad's name. Just, it, it, Chris, uh, send it out. So... All right. Well, thank you, Chris, and and happy birthday, Dad. By the way, there are still so we made we made uh, NFTs of Ben running in high school. So if I you're forgot not, that we did this. So a bunch of people too. said, "Hey, I got my NFT." There was the reveal. Me too. And it's me scoring a touchdown. And still, all of the money is going to No Kid Hungry. So yeah. uh, and by if the you way, want to join the community, a, there's still plenty of room. And we got a lot of people saying this is my first NFT. So credit to the guys at Audiograph because yeah, a seriously. lot of people are saying this is the first NFT I've made. They made this process so easy for people, and they're also helping people on the back end with customer service. So credit to them for making this such an easy transition for people who've never done it before. Because yes. uh, we had a lot of crypto noob people that were doing this. 